Glad to be back with you. I get a lot of questions about Morse Circle, and a lot of them boil down to, well, what's Morse Circle really good for? I mean, I can go through the, the process of drawing this circle, but I can't figure out why I'm doing it. And that seems like a pretty fair question, so maybe let's just talk about that. No numbers today, folks. Just here's the big picture, why Morse Circle is important and why it's a good thing to learn. Okay? Well, let me give you an, the simplest example I can think of. A lot of us have maybe done a test where we will put a dog bone specimen, looks kind of like that, Oops. try that again here, looks kind of like that, and we'll put it in some sort of test machine where we'll pull on the ends of it, okay? And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll put a strain gauge right smack in the middle of it there, or pretty close anyway, and the wires go out there. And what we're measuring is strain along this, the, the test portion, the active portion, of the dog bone specimen. Now the reason we make the specimen like it is, is so that we can get unidirectional stress. There's tension this way, that's the only external force. There's some strain this way due to Poisson's ratio, but the only external force is that way. We're interested in the stress that direction. All right? Well, let's say I've got my, my pretend strain gauge. This is magnetic, so I can stick it on my board. Let's say we start that way. The gauge is the, the active axis of the gauge is that way. I'm going to get a certain number, whatever that number is. I'm going to get a lot of strain in that direction because that's where the force is. If I were to take this gauge, just make sure you can see it there. There's a, I've got the gauge drawn on it. In fact, you know what I ought to do? Let me get my marker out here and I'll draw a big arrow on the front of it here. Okay, there's the, there's the active, well, let's see here. There's the direction along which this thing is sensitive, okay? So I've got a big old blue arrow on it right there. It's sensitive along in that direction, right? And I'm going to get a certain number when I use that. Well, what if I take this gauge, and let's, let's say I have some really special gauge I can t pick up and move if I want. Well, if I turn it that way, I'm going to get a different number now. I'm going to get something that's a lot more related to Poisson's ratio. There's no external force that way. There's only the contraction that comes because of Poisson ratio not being zero. All right, well, what if I took it and lifted it up again, and then I put it at about 45 degrees? I'd get a different answer still, right? It wouldn't be that due to the external force, and it wouldn't be the strain I got due to Poisson's ratio. It would be something different. Okay, can we, can we believe that? Right? Because if that's true, what we just sort of proved to ourselves or convinced ourselves of, stress and strain are directional. They change depending on where you go on a part, but they also change depending on what direction you're looking. Stress is directional. Strain is directional. The direction you're looking, pull that back up there, affects what answer you get. All right. Now let's let's take another example here. This may be a little more complicated than that. Okay. I was originally trained as an aerospace engineer. I guess I'm. I don't know. Maybe I am still one, but I haven't done that kind of work in a while. But I like doing aerospace examples. So let's say we have a rocket. Okay. Let's say this rocket is uh, sending a space probe to Mars. Sounds like a fun thing to do. Let's just say it's doing that. Okay. Now this rocket is axisymmetric, right? Boy, that isn't very good, is it? You know, that's just about as good as it's going to get today. It's axisymmetric. It's round. And there's a center line on the rocket. I'll put an engine down here. So it's got fire shooting out the back. and Maybe it's got some fins there. Because it doesn't mean fins in space, but to get to space it has to go through the air, so it'll have some fins. And it's got some very interesting payload up there. We're going to go up and look for water on Mars, maybe. Okay? So it's got a payload up here that weighs a bunch, and it's got an engine down there that's pushing up. Well, what's in the middle here? Well, if you, if you don't know about what's in the inside of rockets, on uh, the kind of rockets we use to launch space probes, there's fuel tanks in there, and those fuel tanks are pressurized. From about here to about there, the average rocket is a thin-walled pressure vessel. Okay, so let's think about what stresses are on this. There's a force going up, and then there's the, you know, the inertial force, MA, of that mass essentially pushing backwards. And so this part of the, the, the fuselage 
is in compression. Well, it's also pressurized from the inside as a thin walled pressure vessel. So there's hoop stress and axial stress on it. There's fins down here. And what you may not know is, is to keep the rocket going straight, these engines can move a little bit. They can actually change the thrust vector you know, to actively keep the thing pointed in the proper direction. And so maybe there's some lateral loads from air forces on the fins and from the thrust vector changing. Point is, up here, let's take our, let's take our strain gauge, let's put it right there. Okay, and the strain gauge is awfully big compared to the rocket. Um, I, I just made it this big so you can see it. It's routine to put strain gauges on rockets and have them telemeter the data back. This happens all the time. All right, so I've got a long axis on this thing, and, the, and if I'm going to analyze it, I'm probably going to put one of the, the axes down the center of the rocket, just because it's convenient to do. Right? And maybe I'll put some strain gauges along those axes. But the state of stress, and therefore the state of strain, is pretty complicated. You know, you've got forces this way, and you've got pressurization, hoop stress, longitudinal stress, you know, maybe some bending because of the engine gimbling back and forth, maybe some more because of side loads on the aerodynamic fins. It's a very complicated stress field. Okay? I'm going to calculate it, probably assuming that's one of the axes, just because that's geometrically a very good idea, idea to do. Now, since I'm going to calculate things and maybe measure things along that axis because it's easy to do, I have to assume that I'm seeing the stress only in one direction or the strain only in one direction. Any reason to think that the maximum stress or the maximum strain is going to be in this direction? Probably not, unless I'm just the luckiest guy on earth. No, the stress, the maximum stress is not going to be that direction. It'll be some other direction. Maybe it's that direction. Now, I may not know what direction it is, but the structure, the structure knows. And when the structure is deciding to fail or not, it isn't going to fail based on the strains or the stresses only in the direction I happen to calculate or I happen to measure. It's going to, count, going to uh, fail based on the maximum, whatever direction that happens to occur. Now, I can calculate or measure only in one direction and just hope I've got it right that somehow I'm capturing the maximum. That sounds like a pretty good way to blow rockets up or make bridges fall down or boats sink or buildings fall over or lots and lots of bad stuff like that. Or I can measure them, calculate them using some convenient directions, right? And then go through a process or circle to figure out based on the numbers I do know from either measurement or calculation to figure out where exactly are the or what is the direction of the maximum stress and strain and what is the magnitude because the the structure knows it. If I don't know it, that's my problem. So I'm going to measure or calculate strains, stresses, in convenient directions, and then use more circle to say, okay, from data, from directions I happen to know, how do, or what is the maximum stress in shear, and what is the maximum normal stress, and what directions are they compared to the directions I'm assuming, okay? So I may measure along this axis. And let's say I run through more circle and more circle tells me that 22 degrees clockwise is the direction of maximum stress. Well that means if I were to take this, rotate it 22 degrees and stick it back on, it would now see, mac well maximum strain, stress and strain are related, and this is a strain measurement device, but it would see that maximum, okay? so. I can either calculate it in a whole bunch of directions and measure it in a whole bunch of directions, which is not fun at all, or calculate or measure strains and stresses in a convenient direction, and then use more circle to tell me if I know stresses in this direction or I know strains in this direction, use that information to tell me, number one, what are the maximum stresses, and number two, what direction are they? That's why you do more circle. And I'm going to leave you with an example. I, I love this. Uh, another member of the faculty here gave me this, and it's a wonderful part. This is the handle 
of a compound bow uh, after the uh, first couple of steps in the manufacturing process. It's actually extruded as a big bar, okay, so it's a relatively complicated shape that way, and then the extrusion, a piece is just cut off the extrusion, and all this milling work gets done. So there's lightning holes in it, and there's all kinds of features. Eventually, let's see, I'm, I'm a left-handed archer, so I wouldn't hold it this way, but this is, this will eventually be, oops, I got it backwards here, this will eventually be the handle, and the limbs will come off that way and that way. And there's these cool little dynamic uh, dampers here. There's all kinds of interesting stuff. How would you analyze this? Well, I might start that way. It looks like, you know, it's about as close to a, a central axis as this part is going to have, all right? And so maybe I'll put strain gauges along this axis. Any reason to think on a piece this complicated, maximum stress is going to occur that way? Boy, I doubt it. But I'm probably going to measure them this way, or calculate them this way, and then use more circle to tell me, number one, what are the maximum stresses? Because if I don't know what they are, and I overstress this part, I'll pull this thing back, and the bending, the loads on the end of it, the bending moments essentially on the end of it, may fold it over on me. I don't want to pull this thing back and have it just fold like a coat hanger in my hand. That would be bad. No fun at all. So I can use more circle, maybe. If I know data in this direction, and perhaps data in that direction, I could transform that data. And tell me, number one, what is the, what are the maximum stresses, and number two, what direction do they occur? That's why we do more circle.